All right, guys, how are you doing? Module six. Wow, we're cuffing along through the course here now. Very cool. Um, all right, uh, this chapter is, so, so first of all, again, just to be clear, we're on chapter eight now, beginning chapter eight. Um, it's called structure or function, and, and really this lecture will be on this structuralism versus functionalism. Um, and then what you'll see is, is some other stuff that all counts as functionalism too, but we're gonna talk about things like intelligence testing, um, those of you who have Binet will get to Binet. Um, we're going to talk about some of the ways that psychology has been used in the business world. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about comparative psychology as well, all of which seems to fit under the functional sort of banner. In fact, a lot of things fit under the functional banner. Um, so, so you'll get that. But this lecture specifically, whew, there we go, is going to be really focused on, on this distinction of structuralism versus functionalism. Um, and hopefully by the end of this, you have a good idea with what that distinction is about, although functionalism will always stay a little vague as you'll see. So let's hop in. Um, so the, the context for this is we're gonna focus on America. And in fact, we, we already did a little bit with William James. Um, and in fact, William James, a lot of the people we're going to talk about today we're in the same University of Chicago as William James, and especially when we get to the functionalists, they've they've kind of um, defined one. Well, they defined psychology in America until the behaviorists came, which will be the next chapter. Who redefined it in America? So that's what we're really going to focus on is is America. What I call a few years BR, where BR means before rats. Uh, we sometimes um, you know call psychology. Um, or, or we talk about behaviorism as though it's rat psychology. So this is really going to be the, the world in America just before behaviorism started. And you're going to see a lot of the seeds of behaviorism in what we talk about. Okay, so let's jump into this. So first of all, um, Edward Titchener, we're going to talk about him in a number of, of ways, but you know, before I get into the guts of it, I'm going to tell you what I will on the last slide about Titchener. Maybe his most powerful role, you'll see he did a bunch of things, but maybe his most powerful role was as what I will call a foil down here. And what we mean by a foil is it's somebody that everybody else says, I'm different from that, and here's how. And one of the reasons he became a foil is he defined what he thought was the valid way of, of doing psychology. So he came up with a very clear and very specific definition of what he considered valid psychological research. Sometimes when you're very clear, you become an open target. You know, people can see why, how they think differently than you. You know, if you're if you're really clear about your position, then people really understand what you think is true. And then when they think something differently, they can say, "Oh, but I don't believe Titchener. Uh, I'm different from Titchener this way." And that that is really the main story of Edward Titchener. Is is he ended up being so clear about his position, his structuralist position? He's going to be the ultimate structuralist that other people then kind of said, okay, here's why I don't consider what I do structuralism. Okay, so everybody kind of dissociated themselves from him. Okay, so let's let's get to his structuralism and talk about it a little bit. Make sure you understand where he's coming from before we get to this, this foil kind of question. So the first thing he said, and this is sort of in defense of introspection, he's gonna be another person who believes that introspection is the best method for studying psychology. And he believes that because of things like this, or at least this is the argument he made. So this is called the Muller liar illusion. You can see it here. And, and the idea is that you ask people, which of these lines is longer, the line on the left or the line on the right? And certainly by now, hopefully you've run into this before in one of your courses, and you know the right answer. Uh, the right answer is they are the same length. And it always drives you kind of crazy to look at this because to your eye, it looks like this is a lot longer than that, but it's not. These are the same length. Go ahead, get a ruler, measure them. You will find they are the same length, but they don't seem to be the same length. So he, you know, Titchener was saying, physics is the study of things as they are out in the world, but psychology is the study of things as they are inside the mind. Um, and that can be different, 
these two lines can be the same length in the outside world, but different lengths inside the mind. Um, and then you have to understand why. What is it that makes the left one appear larger? Okay, so he would use that illusion to say, this is what psychology is about. It's about what's happening in the mind. Okay, and not just what's happening in the mind, but he really borrowed the structural functional decision, uh, distinction from biology. And it, it fits biology better than psychology. And I think that's one of the reasons we always kind of stumble when we're trying to teach students about this distinction is because it was borrowed from another discipline where it worked well and imported to a discipline where it sort of works, but not so well. So let's talk about the works well first, and that's biology. Biologists can be split into those that study um, the structure of a body and those that study the function. So for example, you can look at a heart and it could be a dead non-functioning heart but you can still notice the, you know, the, the various chambers it has and the aortas. And so you can actually say, okay, here's what it looks like here. This is the structure of a heart. Somebody else might be interested in, in the function of the heart. What does the heart do for the body? What is its function? And so in biology, we call people who are interested in structure anatomists, and we call that anatomy. People are interested in function is physiology. Um, we call them physiologists. That's the study of physiology. So it makes really nice sense there. And, and the critical thing Titchener said is if you're a biologist, it doesn't really make sense to start studying the function of something until you understand its structure. So he thought structure had some sort of um, special mojo, um, that, that it's where you start. Uh, if you want to understand the heart, you start by looking at the heart and seeing what it looks like. And then um, you start to imagine it functioning. And now that you know what it looks like, you can understand the role that it's playing and how it plays that role. So structure was where you start. And so in psychology, um, Titchener thought psychology is still a very young science. We're still trying to understand the mind. Yes, so the mind, conscious experience, these sorts of things. So Titchener is going to, you know, we talked a lot about the unconscious with Freud and, and um, um, Jung and all, all of those. Uh, Titchener is not an unconscious fan. He's not a fan of the unconscious. He's studying the conscious mind. That's what he thinks is relevant. Doesn't even know if there are things, unconscious things. So we've gone kind of back to a Wundt kind of stage. And, and Titchener is very Wundt-like, I should say, by the way. <laughs> Let me back up. Titchener studied under Wundt. He was one of the first in Wundt's lab in the late 1800s. Um, and he learned a bunch of things there. Uh, and he brought those things back to America. So, so Titchener is literally the link between Wundt and America. Um, and so it's not surprising that he's very Wundt-like in, in his approach. And everybody, you know, although Titchener really describes structuralism, everyone would say Wundt is a structuralist too, because structuralists care about what the mind looks like. It's, it's almost, or what things look like in the mind. What is the structure of conscious experience? Um, and so again, Titchener thought that was the predominant question. That's what we have to answer first. And until we answer that, we shouldn't worry about the functional level. What is the function of consciousness or the function of the mind? So he was really focused on the structure. And, and let me see where I go with this. Okay, I'll go there in a second. But he, and he thought the structure was made up of, of sensations. He, he was also, we're going to run into this in this chapter. He, he was a deconstructionist. What does that mean? The, the best example is chemistry. You know, when we look at anything in the real world, like this glass or the water within it, you know, it has all this, this, these neat characteristics, but ultimately we think each, th this stuff can all be reduced down, hence the reductionist, reduced down to some very simple um, elements that are interacting in various ways, you know, very simple chemical structures. And so if you have, you know, high hi two hydrogens and an oxygen and you put them together, you get this weird thing. And it's very different, but it can be reduced 
to hydrogens and oxygen. So it's just sort of built up of those things. And so Titchener thought that when it came to the mind, sensations were those basic, they were like those basic elements. And sensations could be combined and built up, very elementary sensations could be combined and built up to become our more complex conscious experiences. So he wanted to get at what are those building blocks of conscious experience? And that's a very structural approach. I hope that's kind of cool. Sometimes you need to hear about functionalism to really get structuralism. So let's let's kind of hold that for now. Um, he was also very known for his rigor, his, his lab rigor. Um, in fact, he created this lab manual, which became sort of the Bible for experimental psychologists. So one of the, we're going to get to Titchener's definition of psychology, but one of the things he thought he said is it is experimental. Um, so you know how Vlint said, well, there's some things you can do in the lab, but there's other things like this cultural stuff where you, where you have to use different methods. Titchener thought there was only one method for psychology and it was experimental approach. It was the experimental approach. That's the way to do psychology. Anything else is not psychology. So he's going to be very strong about these things. And that's why people are going to say, oh, I don't agree with him. Okay, so a lot of people aren't going to agree with him, but very strong. Um, and so when it came to this experimental approach, he literally wrote the book. <laughs> he, and in his time, wrote this book about how to do psychological research well. And it was predominantly introspection because that was the method that was known. But as the book gets into, it'll talk about things like um, teaching people how to introspect, but also teaching them how to report about their introspection, the right way to use words to describe what you're experiencing. So he was very fastidious about details um, and, and about doing things sort of right and certainly in an experimental way. Okay. So this, uh, I, I stopped here just because I, I hope this gives you a, a sense of a structuralist perspective of psychology. So one of the things he wanted to get at was what are the things that go into conscious experience, right? What are those basic elements? And uh, apparently he was producing this work on it and everybody was waiting for him to unveil this and he died. <laughs> That's not, I shouldn't laugh about that, but it's just kind of, he died. Um, and so nobody knows, knows exactly what he was going to say. Um, however, somebody found a paper he had lying around and published it after his death. Um, and Boring, who you also know as the person who wrote the first history of psychology textbook, right? Because we began the course of talking about him. Um, he ended up talking about what he thought, and Boring was one of Titchener's students, what he thought Titchener was going to say. And basically, um, the notion was that conscious experience um, is made up of things that have four dimensions. So he was getting into the dimensions. These are four ways things can vary in consciousness. Um, the quality of the experience, uh, which refers to the variation in base experience, such as different colors or tastes, right? So something has a, a quality. It's got a color, it's got a taste, it's got something. It's got an intensity, how strong is that color or taste? It's got an extensity. Um, it, yeah, it makes a lot of sense with touch. How far away is that that thing? So things that are um, out in our real world, we can kind of get an idea of distance from them. And then finally a protensity, which is the duration of that experience. Um, so, I mean, again, wh whether this is right or not, it kind of makes sense. Things in your mind, sometimes some they have different qualities. Sometimes some things are more intense than others. Extensity is the kind of tricky one there. Uh, protensity, sometimes things stick in your mind longer than at other times. Um, again, less about these four qualities for now. But what I want you to get at is this idea of somebody who's saying, what do things in my consciousness look like? If I had to describe them, how could I break them down or reduce them into uh, lower units of description? And that's, and here's four units, four lower units of description. Um, sort of like H2O is two hydrogens and an oxygen. We can say, you know, that experience I had, had this much intensity, this much potency, this much quality, etc. cetera. Um, okay. So that's the goal of a structuralist. That's what they're trying to get at. 
Now, I'm not going to read all this, uh, and I just pulled this from page 175. So I'm just going to highlight a couple of things here, and, and I just um, put all these words on to, to kind of guide me um, in when I do this. Now I need my H2O. Right. Okay. Starting from here, Titchener believed psychology to be, first and foremost, the study of the generalized human mind by means of experimental introspection. Short sentence. It's got a lot in it, um, actually. Uh, and, and a lot of what it has in it is what psychology is not, according to Titchener. So this is a very exclusionary view of psychology. So first of all, he says it's the generalized human mind. Um, and what he meant by this is he was interested in sort of the average mind that a human has. He was not interested in why some people are more intelligent than others, why some people are more extroverted than others. Those things are called individual differences. Some people study individual differences. What makes somebody different from another person? Titchener did not think that was part of the psychological investigation. He thought we were trying to understand the average human mind, not all the subtle variations of it. Okay, so if, if you're somebody interested in intelligence or personality, you're you're like not happy with Titchener right now because he just said you're not doing psychology. Okay, who else do we have <laughs> that he can offend? Because <laughs> he offended a lot. Um, when he says this generalized human mind, he's implying the adult mind, the fully developed, the mind at its best. Um, and so that means things like children or animals. Um, are not worthy of study, not because they don't have minds. He, he believed that there was a wide range of minds, a wide range of animal minds, but he really thought that we should be studying the average developed human mind, that that was our goal. Um, and therefore, don't worry too much about children, don't worry too much about animals. They're different variants again, almost like the individual differences, but we really want that average one. Now, first of all, by the way, using the word mind, um, you're studying the mind. By saying it was a study of mind, um, he was taking this position that many people have now um, not wanted to take. So when we get to behaviorists, they will say it's about behavior. Psychology is the study of behavior, not the study of the mind. The mind is not a scientific thing to study, according to a behaviorist. But he's saying that's exactly what psychology was studying. And then finally, his use of the word experimental and introspection, really, kind of reduces what, you know, if you're not doing experimental introspection, you're not doing psychology, all right? So yeah, that very simple sentence um, really defined psychology very narrowly and said, you know, the people who are doing what I'm doing, <laughs> kind of, are psychologists. Those other people that are doing that other weird stuff are not. Um, and so when I say he became the foil, um, you know, I hope you have the sense here that by being so clear and specific about what he thought psychology was, he made it easier for other people to, to disagree with him, but also to have something clear to disagree with. So they could say, you know, for example, Titchener says it's the study of the mind, but we think it's the study of behavior. You know, when somebody says that's the study of the mind, then you can realize well, that's not what I think. I think it's this instead. And so it allows you to kind of tease apart differences that otherwise might be never spoken aloud. Um, and so it's not a bad thing to be a foil, like Titchener was. Um, he really helped people to, to verbalize why and how they disagreed with them. And I think that helped us to understand the different variants of psychology that exist. Because most of us do not agree with Titchener that that's psychology. Most of us think it is much broader and does include different methods and animals and children and individual differences and all that. Um, but, but he really served a role by helping people think that through. Okay, I'm not going to belabor that too much. Um, so I'm hoping you have a sense of structuralist, you have a sense why he's the foil. We're going to now move, see, paradigm shift um, to functionalism. Uh, because, you know, really, um, a lot of people, when Titchener said this so clearly, they said, is that what psychology is about? Are we all supposed to be just figuring out what the elements of the mind are using introspection? Is that what's really important? And so, you know, you see things like physics is the study of the outside world, 
um, the structure and the movement is what it's about. So, so there's, you know, stuff going on then in the outside world where that would make you want to focus on structure. So physicists, yes, they focus on the structure of things. Um, and, and so therefore, you know, a, a psychologist might do that same sort of thing focus on the internal world. So that's why they called them psychophysicists, Fechner, Weber, because they were kind of doing what physicists did or taking that same approach, but turning it inward. Darwin came along and he basically made the point that the structures that an animal has, the characteristics that an animal has are not random. They're not just, oh, one has this and the other one has that. They reflect a function. Uh, and that function has to do with success in that environment, the reproductive value um, that, that, that that attribute enhances. So things look the way they do for a reason, and that reason has to do with the function of those things. And Darwin started telling biologists, it's the function that matters, not the structure. Um, so remember that little, you know, biologists start as structuralists and then uh, maybe become functionalists. Darwin really pushed them to say, hey, the function is where the action is. That, that's the more interesting things. Um, so yeah, the cool stories, the interesting things is in the function, not the structure. Uh, and so a lot of people said, let's not worry so hard about what consciousness looks like or what the attributes are. Let's worry about what it does, what it's for. Um, what is the function of it? Now, in that general sense, we can define functionalist, but Basically, functionalism is a very um, open approach. Um, if you're interested in the function that something serves, you're in our camp. It, we don't care what methods you use, if you're studying children or chimpanzees or humans, etc. So it was a very open school. By the way, it's a good chance to use the word school. Um, every now and then in, in psychology, we talk about schools of thought groups of people who had some common belief structure. And so structuralism is considered a school with Wundt and Titchener as perhaps the most you know, classic examples. Functionalism is considered a separate school, a different school. So people who didn't believe in structuralism but believed in something else. But the functionalist school is very broad-minded. It accepted people with, with all sorts of different approaches to how they did things. Um, whereas the structural school was much more narrowly defined. Okay, functionalism, yeah. So let me just give you a little bit of this functionalism and some of the complications it started to add. Um, and because some of this is gonna be relevant when we get to behaviorism as well and other things. So I'm gonna talk about a couple here, John Dewey. Let's start with John Dewey. Now, a lot of people were, were talking about Certain stimulus gives rise to certain response. Again, feels behaviorist, but this is even before behaviorist. We saw this in some of the in some of the other people we talked about, where they're talking about how stimuli produce a response. John Dewey was one of the first to say this is too simplistic. Just like that reductionist, just like that chemistry notion that you know you just build add elements together and they become more complicated elements. Um, Dewey thought everything was more complex than that, more interactive. This is a hard thing to describe well, and, I, and I'm gonna need Dewey's words a little bit to say it, but, but he didn't like the notion that the stim, a certain stimulus can give rise to a certain response. He said, no, no, the stimulus and response are sort of woven together. They're, they're interacting the whole time the action is on. And it's not right to just talk about them as though they're separate independent things. They're not, they're, they're two interacting things. So he gave an example like this, a child reaching out uh, to touch a candle. I don't even think we have to do the touch a candle thing. I think that's, I think I, I grabbed this from him and, and sorry about the uh, little question marks there. That's just stuff that didn't render right, they're dashes. Um, but I'm gonna read this a little bit to give you a sense. This is Dewey's words because I had to get to his words to try to parse this through myself. Um, with the act of seeing, it is looking and not a sensation of light. Uh, don't worry about that. Um, let's start here. Now of this act of looking, the seeing stimulates another act, the reaching. It is because both of these acts fall within a larger coordination. Seeing and reaching, we do it so often. So um, you, can't, you can't see what I see. So it's hard for me to, I can reach for you. Ah, yeah. So if I wanted to reach for the microphone, um, I'm seeing what I want to reach for and I'm reaching. 
but it's not like it stops. It's not like I see, oh, there it is, and I reach, and I'd probably miss it. I don't know. It's that I see while I reach, and those two are constantly interacting. My seeing and my reaching is constantly inter interacting and fine-tuning what I'm doing. Um, and so let's say this way, because seeing and grasping have so often been bound together to reinforce each other, to help each other out, that each may be considered practically a subordinate member of a bigger coordination. So as there's this bigger story of reaching for something you desire, which involves seeing that thing and then reaching for it, but then adjusting your reach based on visual information, etc. cetera. Um, so more specifically, the ability of the hand to do its work will depend either directly or indirectly upon its control from the mind, I guess, as well as its stimulation by the act of vision. If the sight did not inhibit as well as excite the reaching, the latter would be purely indeterminate. If, if, if seeing something you wanted just said, hey, reach, and you just reach, you know, you're never gonna get the thing you want. You have to reach in a very specific way, which means there's a bunch of ways that you, you shouldn't do it. You shouldn't start going over here if what you want's there. You shouldn't start, so you wanna inhibit these wrong actions and excite the right action. Um, and so the seeing is involved in all of that too. So you're just getting the complexity here. The, um, okay, the reaching in turn must both stimulate and control the seeing. So, so what we, how we see and what we're looking at depends on where the hand is. So the eye must be kept upon the candle if the arm is to do, it work, do its work. Let it wander and the arm takes up another task. So if I begin reaching for this, but then my eye goes over here, then this now no longer has the input it needs to do its thing. Um, in other words, we now have an enlarged and transformed coordination. The act is the act is seeing no less than before, but it is now seeing for reaching purposes. There is still a sensory motor circuit. Um, one with more content or volume. So, I mean, I, I hope you get the idea. It's not like see what you want and reach for it. He's saying, no, no. Sensation and response, stimulus and response are interacting with each other all the time. Um, it's much more complicated. We're going to see this with Gestalt psychology. We're going to hear this story again with Gestalt psychology and, and other areas where we're talking about top-down processes affecting bottom-up processing. Um, this is going to be this interactive system. So he is, he's one of these ones to argue that our sensory system is not a, a very you know, simple system like the way chemicals are built. It's more complex and more interactive. I hope that uh, made sense. I also like this. This is just a funny. So John Dewey. So they, they emphasize this in the textbook for the following reason. They say functionalists um, often uh, became interested in the applied value of their work. And so they were trying to actually do something useful with what they were learning. Dewey was interested in education and enhancing education. And it's a funny part of the chapter. Dewey argued that we spend too much time in formal education, especially with younger children, trying to teach them the things they'll need when they're an adult. Things like math, let's say. When they're not, in his mind, their brains, a child's brain is not ready for math and doesn't really need math. And what we should do is let children be children which is not to say we shouldn't teach them. We should teach them, but we should allow them to kind of guide what they want to learn about, um, and which makes it kind of harder to teach them, right? So we now call this personalized learning, you know, letting students choose their own path. Um, but, but he argued that the brain would figure stuff out if you just kept it engaged and stimulated with things to learn, but didn't try to force what it learned. So he said, don't worry about reading and writing and, and arithmetic. Um, let's not force these curriculums on our students. Let's let them tell us what they wanna learn and we work with them. It's a hard way to teach, by the way. Um, personalized learning is difficult, but kind of an interesting little um, a little thing there. And, and again, the idea of the function here is that he's, he's trying to figure out, you know, how to use what we're learning in a real world context. Okay. And now Woodworth. And Woodworth is the, um, uh, the last person I'm going to talk about in this chapter. 
I don't want to get too complicated with this. So, so the, the, cause it does get a little complex and hard on the head. So I'm going to try to tell you the level at which I think is most important that you get it. Uh, but first of all, Woodworth was a writer, a textbook writer and a very successful textbook writer. He wrote an intro psychology textbook that did very, very well. Um, and he also wrote an experimental psychology, um, textbook, uh, that, became very well known as well. Um, and so he was kind of reacting to some cases to some of the ideas in Titchener's experimental psychology um, and disagreeing with, with a lot of them. So the first thing he wanted was, you know, Titchener would talk about a stimulus giving rise to a response. And we've already talked about, you know, one reaction to that. Um, but he stuck this O in between. So instead of SR, he liked SOR, where O is, um, well, it's, it's the observer's yeah, observation. So yeah, let's just go through this, make sure. In Titchener's world, the O stood for the actual observer, who was the person looking into their mind, the introspectionist, right? And so they were the ones looking into the, into the mind. Um, but Word, Woodworth kind of changed that um, and said, um, the subject is no longer the observer uh, who reported, but is an organism that responded to stimuli. So we start to see um, the, the subject as, as an organism that's responding in a certain way. Uh, and, and so he just kind of changed um, the sense of the observer there. But the, I think the more important thing here is, so you have those SOR, but he also thought, ah, these are complex ideas, um, that people did not go into situations naive and sort of as a blank slate. But he brought in this notion of a set. If you were expecting to have to do something or expected to be in a certain situation, your mind preloaded things. It, it got ready for that. And, and he called this your set. Um, and so the world defines your set and the organism within that world responds, which affects the world. Um, big picture to get from all this is people are starting to say, hey, things are a lot more interactive. It's not as simple as people thought it was. Uh, and he's playing that game as well. And that's that's the main thing I think I want you to get from that. Um, he was also known, by the way, of being as being a very good communicator. I don't know how, how great this works. I and mean, it works really well on, on me. But you know, when you talk about correlations, um, and the idea that two things can be positively correlated. So as one gets bigger, so does the other, but they might not be perfectly positively correlated. So it could be that one gets bigger and the other actually gets less at some period of time. And you're like, what? So to kind of express that, he came up with this picture comparing height and weight. And so in here he's got the individuals um, ranked according to height, tallest to shortest. And he's now taken the same individuals and ranked them according to weight, heaviest to lightest. And what you see is that it's not the same order, right? It's sort of the same order. These two guys who are almost up there are, are at the very top of this one. You know, this guy's kind of jump ship and, and this guy's kind of jump ship. Um, and, and so what you see is the tallest is not the heaviest necessarily, but still generally the taller people are heavier. So this might be a correlation of, I don't know, 0.7 or something like that, positive 0.7, <laughs> let's say. But he would try to grab that pictorially. And, and I think that was the point so that students who have trouble with the math could look at that and say, okay, I think I get what you mean. Hopefully that works for you. That is it for, for this uh, lecture. So I'm just going to basically stop there and, and take over from there next time. All right, cool. Bye-bye.